How do you provide visitor confidence around safety? What does it take to create a frictionless experience for visitors? How do you make the destination not just a great place to visit, but also a great place to live? Well, on this episode, that's what you'll find out. I'll be talking to Anwar Dumini, the CEO of Cape Town Tourism, on how they are planning to reopen Cape Town, not just for international tourists, but most importantly, for domestic tourists. Welcome to CR Talks. In this series of travel readiness conversations, I'll be talking to experts, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, key stakeholders on how destinations and businesses are getting ready to resume tourism after COVID-19. Thanks for watching. I'm Fazal, your host for today. Hi, hi, Anwar. Thanks for joining our show today. It's a pleasure to have you from all the way from Cape Town. How are things in Cape Town? Well, uh, good morning from Cape Town. It's uh, just after nine o'clock in the morning. The sun is out. I actually have the ocean in front of me. Wow. Um, and I've got work up in my background. Um, <laughs> And, and I think for me, it, it's almost uh, significant because the sun is rising um, and it almost appears to be a new dawn for, 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 for Cape Town and South Africa in particular, because uh, last night our president, uh, our, our state president actually announced that um, we can start opening up the tourism economy, um, accommodation, accredited accommodation will be allowed again. Um, dine-in restaurants uh, is allowed, conferencing venues are allowed, but with, of course, strict safety protocols. So uh, to you and your audience, you're probably the first ones to hear this. Um, the announcement is literally hot off the press. And as I said, I'm sitting here looking at the beautiful ocean, you know, and, and the sun is rising. And for me, I'm extremely positive about the future of the sector um, within Cape Town. That's, that's great. That's great. Actually, we, I, I really want to spend some time on, on the opening of travel in Cape Town. Um, uh, but before I do that, you know, just you know, very briefly, uh, Anwar, how, how was the, I mean, of course, we are all impacted, some places terribly impacted due to COVID. How, how was the impact generally on the economy and the travel sector in Cape Town? How bad was it? It, it was bad. Um, Tourism was one of the first uh, sectors impacted by our national lockdown, which was about 86 days ago. Um, the presidency declared a national state of disaster around the 15th of March, the Sunday. Um, and then we were advised by that Thursday that all international travel would cease. Um, and then followed a week later by all domestic travel will cease. And what we had then immediately gone to within that spate of literally 10 days was a national lockdown of any form of tourism and travel. Uh, we didn't really have that much notice, but as, as a sector, we were quite comfortable to go into a 21-day, and I'm repeating that, a 21-day lockdown, okay. because we understood that we needed to flatten the curve, we need to give government enough time to put in the necessary um, health protocols, safety protocols, making sure there's adequate um, beds, um, and hospital services in the event we get to that, that, that spike in the, um, in the infections. Um, with that said, um, as much as we look forward to the 21 days, what we realized that after 30 days, 45 days, we were beginning to feel the impact um, with no revenue coming in. And as you know, tourism appears to be a luxury business, but there are very small margins if you look at the entire value chain. Absolutely. And with that, um, a lot of the costs are also in our people because we are a hospitality sector. And because of that, you've got no income, you've got pressure on costs. We started um, engaging with the sector to actually determine what is the size of this impact. And the study we conducted that actually revealed quite a few things for us. I think the first thing it revealed was that uh, our sector generates about 18 billion rand. So that's about 1.5 billion rand uh, Singapore dollars. Right. Um, in, annually. Um, it employs just over 100,000 jobs in the sector, um, which means it's significant. Um, and what we have then figured out was that if uh, the lockdown continued um, beyond, let's say, 90 days, at least 80% of those businesses and jobs would be gone. And that for us was, was the biggest shocker. 
another shocker for us was that um, because we have a lot of small to medium enterprises coming into the sector, they were the ones that were hardest hit because of cash flow. And what we started seeing is, is that small businesses that we've been investing in over the last two decades were actually the ones starting off with job losses. Um, so we started seeing that impact immediately. A lot of those smaller businesses also did not have contingency plans or recovery plans to deal with that. Because if you are a tourist guide, a tour operator, you are the, the operator, you're the secretary, you are the tea lady, you're basically everything. And you'd never have time to really think of what if something bad happens. So it has been a wake up call for us as the tourism body to make sure that we learn from, from, from the impact of COVID-19 on small businesses and make sure we put a mechanism in place to at least assist um, businesses going forward. But yeah, it has been quite significant in its impact. Um, and like I had said, the um, announcement by the presidency last night that we can start opening up the tourism and hospitality sector in a very phased approach with strict um, safety protocols um, is at least breathing a, a bit of life into the sector so that we can maybe still continue to save a lot more jobs. In, t in terms of the phases, I mean, everybody in this part of the world as well, they're talking about probably three, maybe four phases. They talk about the domestic phase, then they're talking about these corridors or bubbles. Uh, fancy names these days. <laughs> and then you have the intra-regional travel uh, and then of course the international travel. And is, is it similar? And uh, What kind of time frames are you looking at from, from a Cape Town point of view? Well, I, I think the approach from a Cape Town perspective is similar to other regions around the world. And it's all based on, on the propensity of the traveler how the traveler wants to visit the destination. And, and that comes down to your, your customer, your consumer. Um, because as much as we want to attract people, it's about making sure we provide consumer confidence. And right now, the consumer confidence around travel is low. As much as we've been in lockdown and we are yearning to travel, that is one of the key factors is going to require you or me um, or someone else who wants to travel to take that first leap. And what we will see is it's like, and, and I shared it with my team the other day was what COVID-19 has done has reset tourism, but it almost takes us back to the very inklings of where tourism started, where you ventured out of your door, you ventured into your neighborhood, you ventured around your city, then in, in your, your province or your region, then you would go nationally, internationally, and that's how your confidence would build. And it's no different now. Because I think what people do is, is that they are so used to the safety protocols that within their city that gives them comfort, that that becomes part of their, um, of, of their focus um, and visit the comfort. And, and I think as that starts improving, we will see a, a, a rise in the staycation. I think okay. a lot more domestic travelers mm -hmm. will stay within their city, around their city, within at least an hour of their city. They are going to have shorter time. Because I think a lot of people's, um, what they call their um, annual leave or um, vacation time has been reduced um, during this time as a, as a mitigation to save costs for companies, which means they've got less time to go and travel. So what we need to do is bear that in mind. But I think more importantly, it's about the safety. How do you provide visitor confidence around safety? And that's where we focus on our, what we call the Travel Wise brand. Okay. Um, we've been running the TravelWise brand for the last three years now, and it's focusing on all aspects of safety, but also responsible tourism. Okay. Because what's also important for us in our, in our strategy is not just about understanding what the consumer wants, but also understanding the communities that the consumer is going to go to or the visitor is going to go to. Because the communities have been affected and have a perception of tourists right now as potentially the people that have brought the virus, spread the virus, um, and, and that becomes part of a way that we also need to educate the community in being ready to welcome that visitor. I think from an industry perspective, the industry has always been ready. I mean, we focus on health and safety as a priority of doing good business. Sure. What we need to do is, of course, ramp it up to make sure that our employees feel safe in their place of work. So how we've approached this on tourism is through what we call from readiness to recovery as a phased approach in order to get back there and then making sure that we continue to monitor um, the markets, specifically the domestic market. I think we've been fortunate enough as Cape Town over the last couple of decades to be attractive to international tourists 
And to some extent, we've probably excluded the domestic market. They feel a little bit alienated, the pricing, etc. And therefore, for us, it's also about saying we mustn't forget about what that consumer, what the locals want and need, and making sure that we actually also cater to them in order to make sure that it is actually their place to visit and experience um, as much as we love to attract international tourists. So, you know, we, we are actually uh, releasing our uh, first report of the COVID in a few weeks and have put a lot of uh, effort on understanding the domestic market numbers. And they are huge in many countries. It's uh, probably not talked about as the international market, but they're substantial, I think. And, uh, I think everybody is now putting some focus and, and also I think you know, opening up domestic market of course helps small businesses in the country to, you know, small businesses are, you know, are the, the worst hit in many, many parts of the world. You know, maybe just to, you know, get your, uh, your thoughts on, you know, everybody talks about small, you know, domestic tourism. Of course, most of our tourism industry has always spent their money in attracting the international tourists rather than the domestic tourists. So what, what exactly would you be doing to, uh, you know, sort of sell the destination to the domestic travelers? I think the first thing in order to sell the destination is it's not necessarily of how we sell the destination uh, because we do attract probably uh, five times more domestic tourists to our destination as volume. But I think because of spin and exchange rate, that becomes a big influencer into the yield that the sector right. actually gets from international tourists. But how we, what we have approached and continue to approach it is about um, value add. Because the thing is, is that a lot of consumers, and, and, and maybe this is also about education and awareness. When an international tourist goes to a destination, there's a lot of planning that goes into it. A lot of people actually save for a long time to go and visit the destination. And it could be their only trip in their lifetime. And I think sometimes a lot of domestic people forget about that. They almost assume that oh, um, my, my month in paycheck will be able to afford X, Y, and Z. And therefore, the context and the view of an international tourist compared to a domestic is slightly different. Even though something could be in your backyard, you know it's in your backyard, the likely for you to go and visit it is you put it off to another date. No, it's fine. I can do it again. I know it's there. I know it's there. And I think that becomes a thing of how do we change perceptions and the barriers to that. And for us as Catholic Tourism, it's always about listening to the domestic market. Similar to what you would do to anything or finding something is, and that's difficult for a marketing organization. Our job is to always talk about the destination, um, to sing its praises, to share all that's great about it. But importantly, in order to do so, um, we also need to be able to listen. And something my mother has always instilled in me growing up was, you have two ears and one mouth. Use the one better than the other. And, and trust me, you will go far. And that's the same approach we have it in, in domestic tourism. We actually need to listen, but not listen in order to respond quickly and say, here's a package as an offering. Right. Is to actually get uh, and do a, a proper in-depth analysis around what the domestic market wants. And not also from a perception of myself as a domestic traveler. I think sometimes that's where the bias comes in. So it is about allowing for an independent view and, and, and understanding of that market. And what we have picked up so far is price sensitivity. We are in a global financial crisis as we're coming out of COVID and as well as a, a local domestic crisis financially. So price sensitivity is going to be a huge determinant for anybody. Secondly, there's going to be also fewer people with, that are employed. So where tourism ranks on the hierarchy of needs is probably going to be far lower down. So it's about understanding those things and making sure we have maybe mechanisms of where people could, you know, put some money away towards a holiday at a certain time of year, um, yeah. almost like a share to some extent that allows them to plan, but it also becomes affordable enough that they can look forward to something. Um, I think also for us, it's also about making sure that not just around the price sensitivity, but also around how do we make sure that it is welcoming to locals? Because sometimes I think as locals, we may see a restaurant or a hotel or an attraction as being for tourists True. and assuming that um, I'm going to feel left out. It doesn't feel like it's, it's me. And that is also a cultural shift. So that's why it's important for us to work with communities to understand and not just saying, let's tell you the value of tourism for your community, but let us also listen to you as a community. If you want to travel within your own city, 
what are the barriers? What are the perceptions? What are your frustrations? And how can we then address that? Not just as a tourism sector, but also as local government in order to make sure that we can provide um, those forms of support. So a big listening exercise um, okay. before we start doing the marketing and, um, and all the other communication and promotion. Great, great. I, I also saw there was a hashtag campaign called Love Cape Town or something like that. Was, was it meant to sort of uh, uh, keep Cape Town in the, in the hearts and minds of the locals or? Yeah, so uh, funny enough, I think five days into lockdown, one of the things, one of the team members said, actually, how do we make sure that at this time, uh, Cape Town still remains top of mind in lockdown? Because what you have is you've got captive audiences sitting on their devices, sitting in their homes, right. looking for content and being in lockdown, dreaming of that next vacation. And what the team literally came up with in, in a few days was putting together a campaign called We Are Worth Waiting For, Love Cape right. Town. And the simple idea is it's a long distance love affair. Right. What we did is we tried to remind you of the reasons why people have fallen in love with the destination. And there's an old expression as well. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. And before that, before that person gets fonder of a different destination, let us just remind you of why you fell in love with us and that we are missing you. And hopefully soon after lockdown, we can connect again and rekindle that love. So it's mostly a play on being authentic as a destination, but also speaking through an emotive lens rather than the traditional, let me show you a picture and wow. now you must fall in love with us. It's about reminding um, Catonians also of why people save for such a long time, why people um, travel such great distances that it could be their only trip in their lifetime and they've chosen our destination. And that also reminds locals of what we actually got in our backyard, like I've got in uh, my screenshot behind me. Um, <laughs> of the, the, the beauty that our destination has every time. I think the deeper you go into Cape Town, the more beautiful she becomes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember walking down that street many times. Uh, let's move on to a slightly more difficult question. When do you think that you will open up for international tourists? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'm going to play the lottery rather. Um, I might start a bit of so getting the numbers right. But what we have is we've got a short, medium, and long-term um, scenario planning that we've put together around specific timing. Um, if you asked me this question last week, we would have probably been optimistic and saying domestic would have started in August. International would have probably started around December. But because our president made a very early announcement yesterday that we can already start opening up, I think we're becoming a lot more confident that those, those, those dates could actually move a little bit sooner. However, we also need to make sure that we have the industry ready, that we have the communities ready, and that we also understand what the visitor wants and needs. And that even though those dates may be um, a lot more imminent, we also need to be prepared because we're only going to get one shot at making sure that the, the visitor is safe, that the employees are safe, but that it doesn't take away from the overall experience. And similar to, and maybe a good example of is that, I, I don't know if you remember what travel was like before 9-11 um, in New York. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And what travel is like post 9-11. Yeah. Where all of a sudden you've got every single protocol of safety and security that you have to add into your travel experience. That means you need to add it into your transfers of flights if you need to catch a, you know, another flight. If you need to get to a destination, you need to build it into your time, which means it actually takes away time from the destination or the overall experience. It increases stress levels. And understanding that is also important in understanding the entire value chain and journey and saying, if we are going to put in safety protocols, how do we make sure that it doesn't become a millstone around the neck of a traveler that says, you know what, I spent so much time worrying and feeling insecure that I didn't really have time to enjoy and experience this in, in a more meaningful way. And that's important for us in being able to understand that and making sure we create a frictionless visitor experience from beginning to the end. But that's also going to take time. So um, the deadline dates for us are shifting a little bit sooner. And we are hoping in our conversations with the airlines is that they are ready to fly. All it's right. always going to depend on their commercial sustainability, how many people they want to separate between seats, how they want to do their flight patterns and all the other stuff. But I think it's no different from any other place in the world. We are going to start crawling before we start walking and before we start running. 
However, yeah. I am confident that as a resilient sector, we've gone through a lot more difficult challenges and we will rise to through this one again uh, collectively. And that's the beauty of tourism. Um, yeah. you know, it's like a phoenix. It will always rise from the ashes and soar even higher Absolutely. than before. I keep saying that, you know, uh, humans have been exploring, uh, has been explorers for thousands of years, you know, uh, and it's not going to stop. I mean, we'll, we'll have some difficulties in the in the medium term, you know, short to medium term, but eventually we'll, we'll be what we were, you know, that's in our DNA. Exactly. It's, it's not possible to take, take that away. But I think the, 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 the question, I think, which, which is a challenge, I think is, as you just said as well, you know, how do you still make sure that the, the, you know, the visitors have the same level of experience with all the precautions that you need to take, play, you know, put into uh, to, to place. So is there any, anything specific, like say, uh, uh, let's say a theme park or, or, or a park or a shopping mall and things like that? Are, they, are you looking at any specific things, which of course doesn't bring massively down the experience? Well, I think for us, what we are doing is, is that um, in, our, in our state of readiness, it's about understanding what is practical within the business, because each attraction, theme park, um, shopping center is different and the consumers are different. And it's about making sure that locally the domestic market and the locals feel safe there. I think once you give that level of comfort that the locals are safe, the tourists will also feel safe. Because if you do it in reverse, we say I'm focusing on the tourist, then you are actually also not being authentic as a destination because our firm belief as Captain Tourism has always been a great place to visit firstly has to be a great place to live and it's by understanding those nuances in doing it but what we have seen is is that attractions for example are using dynamic pricing uh, online queuing systems in order to make sure that they can um, at least manage uh, social distancing and timing of visits to uh, attractions that is one thing um, there are building times uh, additional time in for the screening um, of, of, of visitors to make sure that that's in place. Um, but then also asking visitors to make sure that they also respect other visitors. Because I think as much as the industry yeah. wants to do stuff, it's also going to depend on the, on the tourists and the traveler respecting the cultures and expectation of the place they're going to visit. Which means that as a tourism this marketing organization, we also need to do more in creating awareness of what those things are for the tourists before they get here. Um, I think a simple thing is also do attractions provide um, masks um, to the tourist, you know, for free, with right. an additional cost if somebody forgets their yeah. mask. So right. it's all those little things that sometimes we might overlook. But I think what we are doing is, is now by getting the hopefully the domestic market to experience the destination first, we can do some some trial and error. We can That's try right. and say, okay, guys, well, before the international tourist comes. Let the locals go, let staff um, and their family go actually and experience the attraction and give feedback. And I think that is part of community feedback and readiness. It's saying, you know, let's use this time now to test all these protocols. It's great in theory when you got in on a piece of paper, when you're doing lobbying for government, you've got all this amazing theory. But we need to test it in practice. And I think that's what we are doing. And that's what we are learning every single day. But we're also looking at international best practice. United Nations, um, other sectors are sharing the international best practice, but we need to make sure it's also appropriate to our destination. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks. I wrote just a few other things that I want to just quickly cover. You know, in terms of markets, uh, you know, international markets, you know, uh, you know, given this uh, thing, so it will be mainly dependent on your airline sector, I assume, you know, uh, or are you looking at specific markets? Of course, mostly market is where we come in. You know, how, how does all this place play into? So what we've done is we've got a set of criteria to evaluate markets. Mm -hmm. And that evaluation happens on literally a daily basis um, because we're seeing shifts. And I think this is the uncertainty with COVID-19. Before you could plan for the next year. Right now you struggle to plan for the next quarter because things keep changing. I mean, even when we were looking at say, okay, China has the, was the first market to come out of this. Now we're seeing what's happening in Beijing, Beijing yeah. and that's again questioning whether they are ready. At mm -hmm. some stage, we said the U.S. market is not going to be ready, but then Trump makes an announcement and then there's a shift. So I think for us, it's a bit of ping pong, but the one thing we are clear on is domestic market. I think while we are doing that, that's just a good opportunity for us, like I said, to test all the protocols, make sure it works, that the, the locals enjoy the experience. Because we also know our locals are also travelers that visit overseas. 
and it's a comparative. So what we also want to do is make sure that instead of our, our locals going to a foreign destination, why can't they also do staycation and grow the economy? So we also need to make sure that we can attract the locals with the spending power to spend that money here rather than anywhere else. So for us, it's important to do that. But we also work quite closely with, with the airlines through a initiative that's been running for the last four or five years now. It's called the Cape Town Air Access Initiative, where it's a, a consortium of uh, government and private sector that actually does route stimulation. And okay. in the last, uh, just prior to lockdown, we actually grew our route expansion by about 19 new routes, um, about almost just under a million additional seats to the destination. Um, and then we also start, we actually got our first direct flight to the U.S. in more than two decades. Oh. So for us, that was a winning formula. And what it allowed us to do is also to continue to keep the relationships with the airlines who are also under financial pressure. So there is going to be some form of um, th rethinking around stimulus um, costs, but also, again, the yield for these routes. And we're going to be back at square one. But I think one thing that's great about the destination is, is that it's still a sought after destination. So um, it's something that we doesn't, doesn't mean that we, we're going to um, rest on our laurels not to market it, but we are a lot more fortunate than other destinations that are just coming out where people are beginning to know about them and then having to go into lockdown. And I think for them, it's going to be a, a bigger struggle. Great. You know, I, I know how, how great Cape Town is, been there many, many times. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a final question, and, and then I'll let you talk a little bit more about if, uh, or anything that you want to add on Cape Town. But... Uh, if you are planning to come to Cape Town in 2021, you know, uh, what would you say? What, what area should we, you know, uh, rather than me telling them, tell us, you know, what they should not miss out on Cape Town? Sure. Um, if you had another three hours, I would be able to do it justice. <laughs> but I think for me, the one thing that always stands out is what we call our big six attractions. If you're a first time visitor, it's coming to see kind of what has made us world famous. Um, and, you know, uh, right now where I'm sitting right now, my, in front of me is actually a clear view of Robben Island, where Madiba spent most of his, 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 his time in prison fighting for freedom. Um, and having to go through that, that emotional experience, not a lot of people get the opportunity to do so. So I think it's, you know, one thing that uh, COVID-19 has taught us is about connecting again with our humanity. And for me, a place like Robben Island, there was the definite lockdown for 27 years for Madiba, where you could see Table Mountain from his prison cell and, 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 and wish for a better South Africa. And I think that's the same thing that we're all hoping for. So one of the definite places would be Robben Island, where you actually go into a bit of lockdown, but the story is a moving story that gives you an opportunity for hope and that the, the future is possible, no matter what situation you find yourself in. So it's a quite a reflective space as well. Mm -hmm. um, of course, one of our biggest shopping centers, the VNA Waterfront. Um, you can shop to your heart's desire. And for anybody that's from um, Singapore, uh, I, I, it kind of fails in comparison to some of your shops. But um, if you have got that shopping bug, I think the VNA Waterfront will probably quench your thirst to some extent. Um, I also think that we've got lots of open spaces. So, from a social distancing perspective, we've got Kirsenbosch Gardens which is probably the, one of the most beautiful gardens uh, with most of the fauna and flora that you won't find anywhere else in the world. Um, here within the city, we've of course got Table Mountain, the Aerial Cableway. So for a short five minute ride, you can go up to the top of the mountain and you've got probably the most gorgeous views of Cape Town. But it also allows you to kind of stand on that summit and overlook and, f and actually appreciate the world um, from a vantage point. Um, instead of just kind of looking up at the mountain. And um, for me, it's sometimes that solace, uh, even though there are people around you. I think if you come, uh, you know, if you're one of the first travelers to come to the destination, you also want to understand in those long queues <laughs> that, that we are so, you know, <laughs> famous for. Um, but for me, I think something that, that, that's really precious is the Boer Cup. I think you mm. can see an image behind me. Um, Cape Town has got a long history of uh, and, 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 and a connection with Malaysia. Um, a lot of the Muslims that are here, and that's almost a million of them, almost a quarter of our, of our population in Cape Town is Muslim. Um, the heritage comes from Malaysia. So we have what we call the Cape Malay. So if you're feeling a little bit homesick and nostalgic, you know what? You can connect with it here. 
Um, but there's also great entertainment, sport. Um, if you're a cricket lover, I mean, at least our cricket is improving. Well, we're in lockdown because nobody played cricket. But, um, you know, whether you want to come and see a local game, um, there's also uh, one of the oldest um, cricket clubs, the Ottoman Club with a Turkish origin um, in Cape Town. Uh, so, you know, for anybody that wants to immerse itself and still feel like home, uh, you know, we've got, a, we've got lots of Muslim restaurants across uh, Cape Town. A lot of the attractions cater for Muslims, so you won't feel out of place. Um, and I think it's that understanding and sensitivity, even um, prayer room facilities, which we have for staff, you know, a tourist can come and use. And I think that's the beauty of it is, is that once you, you become, you come and visit Cape Town, you almost feel like um, you, you've almost stepped into a world where it's a mixture of where I see Africa, meets uh, Malaysia, meets Europe. You'll see a lot of that melting pot stuff and you'll say, oh, that looks a little bit familiar, but I'm not quite sure. That looks like a different place. And I think that's the beauty of Cape Town. It kind of connects a lot of these parts of the world. Um, I can go on. <laughs> uh, thanks, Sandra. Thanks. So, no, I, I agree with all of that. I've been there many times. And thank you very much for, for your time and, and sharing your thoughts. Uh, it's tough times and definitely we'll get through this. And hopefully uh, get to uh, maybe one last question, the most difficult of all uh, to end it all. When do you think we will reach 2019 levels of travel? Well, our forecast in the study we've conducted, people are, are were looking at the end of 2021, right. uh, optimistically. Okay. Uh, pessimistically, people looking at the end of 2022. Well, that was all dependent on when we come out of lockdown, our set of readiness, and then where the world finds itself um, at that time. So I think um, the more we, we, we understand about the virus and how we can uh, protect ourselves, I think the more confident people will become in venturing further beyond their, their, wall, their four walls and their, 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 the door of their, their house. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And then maybe you can also give me the lottery numbers. Maybe we can play both <laughs> what happens. <laughs> All crystal balling, definitely. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. Most definitely, yes. Thanks, uh, thanks, Anwar. It was a pleasure having you. And, uh, you know, uh, definitely we are looking forward to, to getting back to and visiting Cape Town again. Thank you very much. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for watching CR Talks. In the next episodes, we will be talking to more travel industry stakeholders on how they are overcoming challenges to rebuild the travel industry. So join us on our next episodes. Until then, goodbye.